You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Welcome to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll take a deep dive into the world of volatility with in-depth analysis, trading activity reviews, strategy breakdowns, cutting-edge education, and much more. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with the traders, researchers, and asset managers who are reshaping the volatility landscape. If it involves volatility, then you'll find it on Volatility Views. And now, it's time to take a deep dive into the world of volatility. It's time for Volatility Views. All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again. It is time to break down everything going on in the wild, the woolly world. Of volatility, yes, it is time for Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. My name, of course, Mark Longo from the THE OptionsInsider.com, as well as from the ever engaging, ever volatile network upon which so many of you are binging these days. Remember, if you do like what you hear, throw some stars, a like, a comment, a rating, a review. The show's been running for over a decade. It's got a lot of reviews in the bag, but you know, the new ones, they do help the algorithm. The algorithm tends to favor the new stuff. So if you like what you hear, throw some stars a like. It does help all the legion of new people. And man, they are a legion these days. Discover the content when they type volatility into their podcast platform of choice. And of course, if you want to go above and beyond, and how can you not these days? So much great stuff popping off, including options oddities coming up a little bit after this show. So if you don't want your broadcast week to end with volatility views, you want the party to keep going right on into the weekend. Only one place to go, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. Once you're there, once you hit that join button, you won't just get options out of these after this. You'll get pro Q&As. You've had many great vol folks. We just had Mr. Vixologist Jim Carroll on the, just last week tackling all of your many, your legion of vol-oriented questions. That was a fun session, so check it out. You can hit that join button, get access to it right now. Of course, all the other pro Q&As and options out of these and giveaways and live streams, all sorts of fun. The optionsinsider.com slash pro. Welcome to all of our new members who've been joining up over there. As we go around the horn, see who's joining us today on the old Volatility Views program. You know, I've been teasing for a while, listeners, that this person moved to the southern volatility mecca known as Austin. But this week, I am no longer joking. It is indeed true because Austin is the home of volatility this week because the CBOE Risk Management Conference is going on there as we speak, and joining us right now, out of breath, fresh from the conference, he just ran in the door as the show started. He is the greasiest of meatballs, Mr. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com. Mr. Meatball, welcome back to the show. How are things at the conference so far, sir? Uh, it was a really interesting conference. Um, you know, Mark, you'll be uh, disappointed. There was only one presentation on put sales. Oh, I'm out. A lot of the dis- a done. lot of the discussion was around dispersion. And around, uh, you know, market correlation, vol correlation, vol pinning, and um, the trading that's going on between index and uh, equity. Um, it, it, there was a, a, a lot to unpack. There were actually a couple of real big eyebrow raisers that were, were mentioned that I, I can't wait to, to talk All about. Right. I can't wait to see my, sink my teeth into it as well. But before we do that, let's also welcome on our guest for this week. You know him from Twifo, listeners. He's been on there a number of times, making his first appearance here on Volatility Views. He is Rich Assell, the Clinical Assistant Professor of Finance 
over there at the University of Illinois. Rich, welcome to TWIFO for the first time, sir. Uh, Mark, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited to join this new kind of forum here. Uh, I'm surprised to hear uh, Mark say that the, the, there's no talk about selling puts because covered call strategies are the most popular <laughs> ETF this year. So, um, of course, we know that those are basically selling puts anyway. So I'm surprised to hear that. Yeah, he's jo- he's joking with me because I've often been to RMC many times and I've often joked that seven out of ten presentations are the about the joys of oh, selling you know what? I, li- I lied puts. there was another one this morning oh, okay. so, so there the, are a couple there were two <laughs> okay there were two if you filter out buying vix calls and selling spx puts you've filtered out three quarters of the presentations but i digress yeah. uh, before we get into the show proper rich like i said this is your first time joining us on volatility view so many listeners probably hearing you for the first time so give our listeners a quick overview of your background and the options and derivatives world as well as what it is you do over there at the university of illinois Sure. Um, so I, you know, my uh, I started my career in the late '80s, early '90s as a derivatives market maker, primarily in foreign exchange, um, and then did that for the better part of a decade, and then pivoted into the world of hedge funds and hedge fund strategies, primarily equity long short, where I used a lot of der- um, options implementation for my ideas in long short strategies. I thought that was a bit of my competitive advantage um, in trying to identify how. Um, you know, from the bottom up fundamental work, we are trying to determine the different distribution of outcomes and what the market's pricing, et cetera. Um, so did that for the better part of 20 years. And now the last uh, four years or so, I've been down here teaching a variety of classes at Illinois, um, anything from investment research to portfolio management, but also teaching our intro to options and futures, um, applied derivative strategies. And starting in about a year, next fall is going to be a derivatives and trading academy to teach uh, a young horde of of derivative traders, if, if hopefully. Ooh. So, so that's kind of what I'm looking to do, and it's what I am doing and looking to do here at at the Geese College of Business. At that's U-Bot. awesome. You guys have an academy coming up. I had to go all the way into the grad school as an undergrad to take the one course that was offered on derivatives back in the day, and that was enough to lure me to the dark side. If I had had a whole academy, oh, imagine, imagine the things I could have done there. Rich. Instead, we'll have to imagine a little bit of vol, listeners, because we got some. It is time for the volatility review. It's time to break down the latest developments in the volatility trading world. It's time for the volatility review. All right, everybody, welcome to the Volatility Review, the portion of the show where we do just that. We break down the week that was and indeed still is from a vol trading and trending and analysis and unusual activity perspectives. And let me start at the top of the show here with an apology for our, our live folks here, because I know we've had a lot of requests. People are excited. They want the return of the logins here for the show because we are threatening the danger zone. Technically, listeners, the danger zone is really north of 25. So if I was going to stick to the hard and fast rule of the logins. We would not be there. But so many people are excited that, that Kenny would be making a return today on the show. And alas, we don't have it set up here in the, in the studio for a login. So I can't play a logins for you live folks. But here's what I will do. I will make sure that our, our editors cut it in. So all you on-demand folks who are legion, you'll have a little bit of a taste of the logins going right under this right now as I'm talking. So you'll, you'll have your taste of the danger zone. Those of you listening live, you can just imagine it in your head. I, I would whisper, I would sing it for you. But A, we'd probably get a copyright strike. And B, I would never do uh, the logins justice. So just imagine the danger zone. Underpinning all of this here. <laughs> and for those of you who hate the logins, which I know is only a couple of you, uh, just you'll be okay for a few minutes out there. But yeah, coming into the end of the week here, listeners, uh, we are starting to whisper into that air, that rarefied air, that north of 20 land in VIX cash once again. Uh, the S&P, after a, a topsy-turvy week, we started off looking all right, and then, you know, things really started to change in the latter portion of the week. Uh, Powell, as he is wont to do, really kind of cut the legs out from the market yesterday, sent us skyrocketing north for vol. Then things immediately turned. Of course, we had some earnings playing out this week as well. Big names like Tesla screwing the pooch, and then Netflix doing very well. So you had a mixed bag on the earnings front. Then, of course, hanging over all this, in addition to everything going on in Congress, also everything going on in the Middle East. It's a turbulent mix going on out there in the markets that is 
catapulting us back over the 20 handle. S&P off right now as we're talking about eight tenths of a percent. The Dow off about half a percent. Nasdaq off about a full percent. So we are back shy of 4,300 after dancing around it a lot yesterday, listeners. Uh, back below 42 half, actually, right around 42, 45 or so as we're kicking off the show here in the S&P. So again, all of our ball friends looking for all the air. Bix Cash at almost a 21 when we kicked off the show. 20.9. Uh, that's up a little over two, about 2.15 points. They got the high earlier today of about almost 22, 2183, I do believe, was the high out there today. And we'll see. Maybe we will threaten that again if this sell-off persists out there. And, of course, our old friend Vivix looking frothy as heck, 115, up about 11 points from where it was this time last week. You've seen a lot of headlines about, oh, Vix closing above 20 for the first time in a while. And it has been a little while. Uh, we technically did it, I think it was 2003, so ever so slightly back in May. But the real period where we spent a little bit of time north of 20 recently was, of course, back in all the contagion fears back in that March time frame. So you really got to go back to then to have a sustained run above 20, even though we did kiss it for one day back in May as well. So intriguing stuff. Mr. Rich, as our guest, we will start with you, sir. What is catching your eye in these topsy-turvy and, indeed, turbulent markets we have this week? Well, Mark, it's a great point because, I, th- you know, we know how it works here in, in equity volatility in particular because four times a year we get some idiosyncratic risk creep into people's minds. Most of the other time it's macro risk, right? And so, um, and you, you mentioned a lot of those macro factors that are going on. And, and one thing I like to look at is – all of the different risk measures in different markets, whether it be the VIX index, of course, but credit spreads, the move index, FX volatility, et cetera. And they generally tend to move together. And what we've noticed in the last quarter is that, you know, VIX, for instance, until very recently, your credit spreads are at very, very low levels. And in fact, we're at credit spreads near the century lows in terms of tightness. Um, but the move index, the treasury market volatility index was telling us that they were, it was feeling uncomfortable. It was, it was, um, you know, not quite at uh, great financial crisis levels, but it, w- it was elevated and telling us that there was risk out there. Taking we the normally see these things t- start to pull themselves back uh, together. To and the question is, will the move index move lower or will the VIX index move higher? Um, and, you know, to me, earnings were going to be the catalyst for that. And, and earnings, the expectations were quite high. And I think while the, the earnings that we've seen so far, I haven't gone through every report, but the general trend that I see is that, the, you know, the, this quarter's numbers are, are pretty solid, maybe a small beat, et cetera. Um, but the commentary from management teams is that it doesn't look good going forward. Um, now, maybe they're playing the game a little bit, but the stocks are reacting to the forward guidance, the commentary more so than they are to these numbers. And I think that feeds in to this whole idea that the economy was, we know the economy is strong in Q3, but what, it's gonna, what is it going to look like in Q4, Q1? Um, and, and that's it. That's a base case. It doesn't even factor in some of the stuff you're talking about with the inability to pass the debt ceiling, et cetera. So to me, there's there you know there were some signs of a lot of risk in the market. I think the idiosyncratic markets like equities and credit were trying to ignore it. I think as this data is coming through with with the earnings, et cetera, um, and and knowing that there's very little margin of safety in a lot of the equities that were you know priced in a lot of the equities, that we're starting to see some of that uh, luster kind of come off some of those investments. And and that's what we've seen, I think, in this week, especially in the last couple of days. Ah, the move index. It's both tantalizing and frustrating, I think, to a lot of our listeners because it's interesting and it has a, a useful metric that it provides, but also for a lot of our listeners, they just can't come to grips with it because they can't trade it. It's just another one of these abstract indexes that they hear quoted around, but they, they can't really do much with it. But yeah, it is an intriguing indicator and certainly showing us a little bit different perspective on the traditional U.S. equity vol that VIX and so many other flavors of vol products uh, tend to focus on out there. Uh, Mr. Meatball, we'll get to all the conference fun in a second because I know our listeners want to sink their teeth into that as well. Uh, we had a taste of it yesterday with the Flowmaster, but we want the, the main course now. Yesterday was the appetizer. You get to be the main course for all things RMC. But before we get there, sir, another topsy-turvy week in the market. Vol exploding. We are, we are flirting with dangerously close, dare I say it, to the danger zone, sir. What's been catching your eye out there this week? Yeah, you know, you've got the VIX. Uh, it's actually down today, but uh, it's had a really strong week. Vol futures are uh, up uh, and have been, well, now they're starting to turn negative, but vol futures were up this morning. We're in a, uh, we've been in backwardation. We're now in, uh, briefly this morning. 
with uh, November trading above December and the cash above uh, above November. Currently, the cash is still above both futures, but November is basically trading in line with December. So we're we're sitting in uh, a pretty pretty precarious spot uh, if you're a market bull. When you look at uh, volatility markets, they they are flashing some pretty decent warning signs, and um, you know the the spread. This is something I I, I we, you and I already knew this, but this was mentioned uh, that the spread between uh, implied and realized is the widest it's been in over two years. So there is a ton of pent up fear in um, in the VIX and volatility markets right now. It's not that pent up anymore. It's just being unleashed, sir, as we speak. We are all seeing it uh, unfolding right now. But before we get to more of everything that's popping off on the vol front in the vol market, you were at the the bleeding edge of the vol research landscape. And, of course, the practical side as well. A lot of practitioners, fund managers down there at RMC this week. So first, give us your thoughts, the lay of the land. You were super excited to have RMC uh, come to your new hometown. So how was your Sebastian backyard barbecue for all the RMC attendees? And then B, uh, you mentioned kind of a little bit of different flavor this year on the presentation side. What really stood out to you? What were some of the surprises, the interesting presentations, and the takeaways from the event this year? Sir? All right. So from a lot of managers, this one surprised me. Um, I heard f- managers mention that they're long long dated calls on four separate occasions, um, which was really interesting. Just straight uh, equity. Seemed, so you're more like in the money stock substitution type stuff. Or are you talking? Vol- no, out of the money calls. They're they're looking for, um, you know, they wanted that that extra performance and they've been seeing it being long, long calls Oh, um, out of the money calls. Oh, wow. so OK. The, the, and, and this is the guys that are hedged. A lot of the hedge guys um, are are going strangle instead of straight uh, straight put. So I thought that was really kind of interesting. Um, SIBO is launching this dispersion index, uh, and so there was a big discussion, a big push around dispersion. They had um, my friend uh, uh, Noel uh, Noel Smith uh, come on, ex market maker. I, you probably I think you know him. Um, he was in the AOL crowd. Uh, that might. Uh, and he was talking about um, the fact that uh, the dispersion trade has been working really well uh, because S&P vol is not moving. Meanwhile, individual stocks are all over the place. So you're getting a lot of volatility in single stock name and almost no volatility in uh, indexes. So there's a, a big push on dispersion. Um, and uh, then uh, a, they had a. Oh, uh, what was the guy's name from Convexity Advisors? The guy was pretty awesome. Um, I took a bunch of pictures of his slides, and um, let me let me pull up uh, pull up his name so that I don't misquote it. Um, it was sorry for being boring. Uh, yeah, it was um, practical application of compounding convexity. It was David Dredge, who was apparently a, like a, an all star. And he made a couple points. One, that if you um, threw out the 10 worst months and uh, and threw out the 10 best months and, and added in the 10 best months uh, on a leverage, you absolutely crushed it. Uh, and that the, the 40% NASDAQ, 40% SPX, 40% VIX hedge, you know, tail hedge portfolio kicked the crud out of long only. Uh, over the last 15, 20 years. Um, he also pointed out that um, when you look at CPI and CPI inflation, um, you know, where we were the last 15, 15 years, and Mark, I'll send you the picture I took of the of his slide here uh, in in Skype, but the, the last 15 years that we've been, the, a lot of people think where we were in, 20, in 2018 was the normal. That was the outlier. That was the outlier for CPI and CPI volatility. Uh, where we are now is a lot more normal. Um, and if, if you look at the, the plot chart, I'll, I'll send this to you right now, Mark, um, because and and hopefully they don't get mad at me for sharing this. But uh, it was pretty fascinating. Um, and um, so that was a, a big piece um, 
there was so what he was basically saying is drive faster and have better brakes is what he was saying. So when the market is outperforming, you want to jump on on board. Um, then this was, you know, if you, in the world of put selling, what the put the way they pitched it this year was that it's actually a it's synthetic uh, long credit. It, it uh, basically it's the same selling puts is is akin to owning LQD when you look at the returns. So uh, she came up with uh, and and uh, I don't want to misquote what was the girl's name. Uh, was and I'm sorry for that fumbling Man- through this a from little the bit. What? Is that Mandy from she the does Cibo? not work at the Cibo. Okay. No, this was um, it was called revisiting the Merton model, uh, isomorphic insights and practical a- application. It was Megan Miller. She was really interesting. Um, I wasn't excited for a revisit to the Merton model, but um, <laughs> it doesn't you know, leave by off the time the page she was done, I'm glad I was listening. <laughs> but you'll like this acronym. The acronym is CRAP. There you go. Corporate rates are puts. <laughs> they lured you back in with that, didn't they? Yeah, crap. Corporate rates are puts was uh, her pitch. And if you look at um, the returns on selling puts relative to the returns on um, being long, um, you know, uh, something like LQD. The, she was using the Bloomberg uh, credit worthy uh, index. Uh, the the two have a an extremely high correlation, and then you know they've got this new credit VIX, and the credit VIX and the regular VIX correlate at over ninety percent. Um, I also learned some two new words, uh, ex, exogenous and deleterious, which I I enjoyed <laughs> getting uh, getting use. And then they did a panel on zero DTE, and of course they did. You know. One of the things that we people were trying to get them is how do these markets break? And there were two ideas. One, interday trading is not margined at nearly as well or as actively as overnight margining. So you could get a bad actor there in that in somebody that clears maybe a lesser clearing firm that that is of some size that could really cause some problems in markets. And then two, the scenario they really laid out for how things break is what if, you know, market makers are so used to all this retail flow. What if the retail traders have a bad day or two, pull back on their volume, and then a Morgan Stanley or Goldman comes in and sweeps the book? All right. And so the market makers don't have that 40% single, you know, zero DTE retail volume to rely on to, to get in and out of their trades. And Goldman and Morgan just came in and swept the entire the entire ZT, DTE book. Now you're in a position where um, where maybe we have a liquidity problem in zero DTE, uh, and there is some concern that top of book in S and P futures is weakening, not getting stronger. Interesting, interesting. I refuse to believe Goldman would ever contemplate such a thing. So who who would dare? I can't believe Goldman would ever sweep the book right before <laughs> everything falls apart. They would who, never. Who would Neither dare, would Morgan Stanley. Who would dare to believe such a thing could transpire? And, and Mark, I did get some some index socks. Oh, Henry was so, all excited about the swag. He said it was good swag. Oh, year. the swag. The socks are great. I've got socks that say XS, SPX, XSP, and DSPX <laughs> and VIX. They're they're absolutely. <laughs> phenomenal and i can't wait to wait to wear them next time i see you i love it now, i but, was very uh, excited yeah, the big thing there the big push was this dspx the dispersion index uh so that is going to be one that they're going to be expect to hear a lot from SIBO over the next over the coming days yeah that's a fascinating one i think we have a listener question about that a, a little bit later but that one had kind of caught my eye for a couple of reasons not the least of which that they're saying from the outset that they plan to make this a, a tradable product so that in and of itself distinguishes it from the the countless, the legion of other indexes that SIBO is kind of just just throwing out there to see what sticks against the wall. You know, your single name VIXs, all your various flavors of put rights and covered calls and hedge puts and all these other things that you can't trade. The SKU index, they're more just abstract indexes. It seems like from the get-go, this one is planned to be traded eventually. So that does make it a little bit more intriguing to me, I will admit. Speaking of things being intriguing, uh, Rich, I'm curious your thoughts on this. A, have you ever been to an art risk management conference in the past? And B, anything that Mark just laid out uh, stand out to you and maybe make you want to scratch your chin and say, hmm, I want to investigate that a little bit. 
Yeah, I, I have been to the RMC several times. I've been I've presented in the RMC a few times too, and so I, I think it's a terrific conference. Um, uh, I, I haven't, um, you know, it's interesting that in Austin that 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 would be that's a really kind of an interesting new venue for them. So I think that's that probably be a, even a more fun one than some of the other ones. Um, I, I say the uh, when when Mark's talking about the uh, the crap. Um, you know, the, 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 what was it? Credit something. Credit our rates are credit puts. Rates are puts. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the Martin model has been around forever. I mean, certainly all convert and credit hedge funds use the, yeah, you know, certainly rely on that. Um, and, and look to, to kind of hedge out their credit portfolio with low Delta puts, et cetera. I um, mean, to me, that one is that's that concept sounds pretty interesting to me, especially when I know, like I mentioned before, credit spreads are near kind of century tights, et cetera. And we know that we kind of go through these volatility cycles and these credit cycles and, and the credit cycle can can oftentimes um, lead the volatility cycle. In fact, we kind of see that with with um thinking of a yield curve as as a proxy for that, you know, the yield curve leads by about two years. Um, and, you know, when, when, we, when we invert the yield curve, that is. And so the fact that we've been inverted for over a year um, on the yield curve and we're starting to re-steep, and that's usually times of trouble that's, that is that is forecasting trouble ahead for the VIX. And I think it's forecasting wider credit spreads ahead. And so not surprising, some of these new products come out exactly at the time when you might want to think about taking the other side. And so that's kind of what I might be thinking on something along those lines. Um, and it's and frankly, it's about time um, the dispersion, like tradable dispersion product comes out for um, from a, for a more retail audience, et cetera, because dispersion has been like the bread and butter for, uh, you know, for market makers, for um, interbank traders and for mar- hedge funds for quite some time. And it, it can be, especially if you manage it well, can be very profitable. Um, and so I think that's that's a that's an idea that's been a long time coming for sure. Um, and so I, I think. I think I, and, and Mark, I totally appreciate what you're saying. That there's a variety of products out there that are interesting and and uh, can maybe provide some insights. But they're not if they're not tradable. What what do you really do with it? And so I love the idea as well of of having something that you can kind of not only get signals from and learn from, but actually kind of trade um, against the portfolio. Mark, ahead, Mark, one other thing that just popped into my head from this actually this morning. Uh, this morning was not. A, they they had a really really awesome guy come on that it was and I, I'm not going to say the names here because I'm gonna be critical um, that clearly knew his stuff and the person interviewing him did not know what to ask <laughs> but even even with that in mind he did drop this little tidbit that the equity markets are really 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 hedged and the credit markets are massively under hedged right now. Um, which is a little scary and a little eyebrow raising when you think about it. So I could certainly see if I broke down the flow, how that might make some sense. The one thing I would, I would add to that though, is it's interesting to me because we talked about like the, you know, all the different iterations of the VIX that have come out, et cetera. But my experience working on multi strategy hedge fund is that regardless of the underlying, you know, what, regardless of what the strategy is, you use the VIX to hedge. So credit funds use the VIX to hedge. They're not going to use the credit VIX because there's no volume there. Um, yeah. And so and so when you say the equity markets really hedge, it's interesting to me because I wonder how much of that equity hedging is from people that are running strategies on other asset classes um, that are using the VIX and maybe S&P puts or whatever it is that they're using to hedge their other portfolio because they, they can just get more um, immediate liquidity. And perhaps they want that liquidity because they want to flip out of it because they're not really confident that they need a hedge because everything's been kind of um, mean reverting so much. Um, and so that's, that's, that's what's kind of interesting to me to see is, is, is that if that kind of flow is coming from the equity market itself where cash levels are high, we just saw that in the Bank of America fund manager survey, um, or if it's coming from, you know, maybe credit managers um, that are that are buying equity like products. And that I mean, famously, I think 50, 50 cent was meant to be thought to be a credit. Uh, oh, yeah, credit. he was a credit guy. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, you know, but to your point, open interest in, in options is kind of below average open interest the volumes. You know, yesterday as things were blowing up. VIX futures didn't do 300,000 contracts. Um, yeah. So, you know, the and, and may, maybe it's because the equity Equity vol has not really assisted very well in um, in some of this credit hedging uh, for the last two years. 
that's why these guys aren't doing it. And of course, it'll start working now that they're not in, not in. Right. That, that's <laughs> just always about, the case. Just about right? to say, exactly. now How many funds yeah. dropped tail hedging yeah. in 2019? Now it's going to kick in right right when they least expect it out here on the show. But fascinating stuff. Thanks for being our boots on the ground, man. I know it was tough duty for you, Mark, to have to go and and go to the conference right in your backyard. I know it was very hard work, but we appreciate you doing our audience loving it too. the live chat saying thanks for these breakdowns on RMC. Uh, Fascinating stuff for all of us who can't attend. Well, that's why we're here, listeners, uh, to open the doors behind the scenes of all these fun events that you guys uh, can't or just don't have time uh, to get to. Also got some fans for you here, Rich. Got people saying they're subscribing to your your chart of the day on Twitter and they're liking it. So there you go, Rich. Uh, you get nice. Getting like, some, to, like to hear it. Getting some fans out there as well as we keep on rolling. Let's get on into the land of the futures. I know an area Rich is always watching out there. And obviously we had uh, the October VIX future roll off the board uh, since the last time we chatted. So November sliding on up into that pole position and getting a little bit juicier right now as we kicked off the show. It was up almost a full point, about .95. I'm sure if I re-rack that now, it might be a little bit uh, different. And then uh, the Dece future up a little over a point, about 1.1 points out there. And we've all been looking for a while. The cash now is over 20, so you don't need to look far to see where you get over 20 on the term structure. And right now, of course, the answer is in the front month, in November. We were talking for a while about, oh, you know, that inflection point seems to be the middle to end of Q1 of next year. That's where the VIX futures curve really kind of takes a kink up and goes above 20. Uh, now, of course, the whole curve has shifted up. So a little bit of a different ball game. You get out there into late Q1 and you're looking at pretty much a, a 22 out there right now. So a different ball game out there. Rich, how much time, if any, do you spend watching uh, the volatility surface, AKA the VIX futures? And uh, B, if you do spend some time looking at it, what are your thoughts on what we're seeing out there right now? Well, I definitely look at it because, I mean, um, and Mark was kind of talking about a little bit before is like when we kind of go into backwardation, that's that's a pretty strong signal that um, that, that people are starting to get super nervous. Right. And I, I usually look at the fir- the front month versus the fourth month. That's what I've, I've always preferred to look at. And when, when that starts to um, to invert um, for me, that's kind of a signal that maybe it's starting to get a little bit real out there um, and we're hovering on that level. We're not quite there. As, as you guys were saying, um, so I, I think it, I think it's super interesting to look at, and because there's two things, right? It, it it's teetering on the edge. I think, as Mark said, like if if we do invert, you know, this is that's going to be the action point probably for a lot of people to, you know, to really start to up um uh, up their hedging. And maybe they're fully hedged, but maybe maybe they start to to um start to you know take off some of their positions because they're getting you know that's the level of nervousness. Conversely, if, if if we kind of rejected these levels and we kind of go back to the the kind of standard contango, then that's kind of giving you a pretty good signal that some of the um, some of the products that are rely on 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 you know the VIX futures role and how you can kind of take advantage of that role as we move back into contango, that's that's a good time to kind of get involved if we kind of re- reject from here. So I think we're at a really kind of critical level that's super interesting to me. Um, and we can kind of go one way or the other. Um, if I had to guess, frankly, I think that we're probably I still think we might see a little bit more downside. I think I'm. I think this earnings season is going to be a negative catalyst. I've said, I've said for the last several weeks that I think the bar is too high, um, and is only going to disappoint. And the, you know, I'm I'm not uh, shaking from that belief. Watching the kind of the early uh, returns come in, and so that tells me that if this is going to resolve itself by seeing that November trade, um, you know, a few points above um, above the January and February contracts would be my guess. It does seem like we've been hearing that talking point around earnings for a while, right, Rich? Q1 was going to be the one that really blew up the bull and, and kind of showed the R word was, was showing its teeth in the markets. Didn't really happen. Everyone thought Q2 was going to be a disaster. We crunched a lot of the numbers on our site uh, throughout the cycles, and Q2 actually turned out to be exactly even in line with expectations, which is somewhat of an aberration in and of itself. And now people are saying Q3 is definitely the one. So uh, we'll see. We'll see if this is the one, Rich. But yeah, you're right. I've been leaning that way for a while. Sounds like you have as well, Rich. And so far, it has yet to come to pass, which is kind yeah, of kind I of totally agree. And, and I would say one thing: it's not for me. It's not even the Q3 numbers per se. As I said before, like the Q3 numbers are probably going to be fine in line, whatever. But it's it's looking further out. It's looking into next year because if you look at the indexes, look at the S and P, look at the Nasdaq, look at the Russell, the expectations for the next twelve months and the next twenty four months in terms of growth is is the indexes are pricing in double digit earnings growth each of the next two years. And I think as the commentary comes in that says suggests that that's not maybe a, not not maybe attainable, 
That's that, I think that's what people are reacting to. They're putting those numbers back into their DCF models and saying, wait a minute, that target price I have for the stock doesn't look nearly as good. And so I think that it's the out years that are probably affecting the price action in stocks and therefore the perception of investors more so than this quarter's earnings, which I think are probably baked in the cake. A lot to unpack there. Mr. Meatball, your thoughts as well on everything we're seeing out there right now on the volatility surface. Yeah, like like uh, like uh, our, our guest just said, it, it we're teetering. Uh, it is interesting that there is like this big gap between kind of January and the front two months, a little seasonality priced in there. Um, you know, the, the back months are have been kind of really juiced for a very long time. But, uh, you know, we get a we get a one more. We get a, an ugly Monday and things are kind of setting up that way. Right. We got it had a not fun Thursday, uh, depending on kind of how things play out today. Uh, we could be setting up for for a, a Monday that could be pretty ugly. Let's see how things are setting up right now, listeners. And the answer for today, at least from a vol options perspective is decent a little bit more respectable than what we saw yesterday yesterday was kind of a surprising one usually the vol markets love themselves a bit of whipsaw action and we certainly saw that in spades yesterday yet for whatever reason vix which is averaging almost a million contracts a day right now i mean vix is just exploding from a volume perspective the adv right now nine hundred forty six thousand contracts up twenty nine thousand contracts uh, yesterday, for whatever reason, didn't really respond to that Powell whipsaw action. That's usually red meat. That's fuel for the fire for VIX. And yesterday, not so much. But we'll get to that in a second. Today, looking a little bit more robust, closing in on 600,000 contracts. Doesn't seem like we're going to hit the uh, 1M level today, but you never know. A couple hundred thousand lot rolls come in and bam, we're there in no time. In terms of the size positions, what is open for size out there in VIX options right now? Let's do a quick top 10 here, listeners. Right now, if you scan the top 10 you're only going to find one put out there, which in and of itself is kind of interesting. We'll get there in a second. It costs you 193,000 contracts to break into the top 10 in VIX right now. If you know anything about VIX, you know that's actually uh, fairly, fairly steep. So it's not a small amount of OI to break into the top 10. That gets you to the D's 19s. That seems like a fairly reasonable strike right now, all things considered, listeners. <laughs> We're not getting to the wild stuff until we get to number nine, 211,000 of the March 47 halves. There we go. There's the VIX we all know and love now. Number eight, 211,000 as well of the Jan 45. So we're all over it here, listeners. Uh, number seven, 213,000 of the D's 25. So back to, dare I say it, some semblance of normalcy. Uh, number six, right back up, 234,000 of the D's 45s. Uh, number five, 235,000 of the Jan 47 halves. You know, this is starting to look eerily reminiscent of what we used to talk about on the show a year, year and a half ago when it was pretty much all par and above nonsense calls, if you will. I'm not quite to that level yet, but we're, we're starting to get some flavors of that, which in and of itself is maybe emblematic of what Rich and Mark were just saying about how, you know, maybe we are teetering on a precipice here. The vol paper certainly may be starting to lean that way. Uh, 235,000 of the Jan 47 halves. Number four, 252,000 of the No 47 halves. Obviously, the No's been open for a while, but we're starting to see more of these, shall we say, optimistic from a vol perspective strikes uh, opening up out there. Number three, 278,000 of the first and only puts in our top 10, the No 17 puts. Uh, number two, 319,000 of the Dees 40s. And the number one size position out there in VIX options right now, 321,000 of the DEES 35s. So fascinating stuff out here. Let's get to some of the paper we saw out here for this week. And again, it was kind of an on-again, off-again week. When VIX was on, man, it was on. And when days when it was off were A, kind of surprising, given what else was going on in the market, and B, not really keeping pace. Like today, for example, 600,000 is respectable, but not blowing the doors off. Uh, the big dog today, 42,000 of the no 15 puts. So yeah, a lot of puts letting it up today, which is fascinating. Uh, number two, 34,000 of the no 22 is the only call in our top five today. Number three, 30,000 of the no 19 puts. Number four, 30,000 as well of the Deese 15 puts. Those line up pretty well. So maybe a bit of uh, some roll. You're going to roll to the Deese 15 puts. Interesting choice if that's the case. And number five, 29,000 of the Nob 17 puts. Yesterday, like we said, kind of the anemic outlier of the week, only 467,000. If I were to tell you it was a day when Powell was speaking and the market was whipsawing all over the place, in addition to earnings, in addition to everything going on with Congress, in addition to everything going on with the Middle East, 
and I were to tell you the VIX total was 467,000 contracts that day, you would have said I was a crazy person. But that is where we landed yesterday, listeners. The big dog, such as it was, 32,000 of the no 15 puts. Again, a bit of a put strip going up yesterday. Followed by number two, 24,000 of the no 18 puts. Number three, 21,000 of the no 16 puts. Number four, 19,000 of our only call in the top five yesterday. 19,000 of the no 40s, four O's, interesting strikes across the board here. And number five, 17,000 of the no 17 puts. The rest of the week, VIX was on, and it was on pretty aggressively, listeners. Wednesday, 1.13 million. Uh, the big dog on Wednesday, 81,000 of the no 25s, followed by number two, 57,000 of the no 17 puts. Number three, 54,000 of the March 50s, five O's. Number four, 48,000 of the no 16 puts. And number five, 44,000 of the Nov 13 puts. We do have interesting dichotomies going on here with these strikes listeners. Either we have a whole bunch of puts going up or we have, shall we say, very, uh, very outlandish call strikes. That seems to be where everyone's landing these days. Kind of fascinating. Tuesday, 1.1 million. And once again, a banger day. The big dog on Tuesday, 53,000 of the October 20s, obviously going into expiration there. Number two, 43,000 of the Oc 19s. Number three, 42,000 as well of the Oc 17 puts. Number four, 40,000 of the February, 42 halves. It's our first size February we're seeing slotting in here. And number five, 37,000 of the Nove 25s. That also does speak to what we were talking about with that kink in the in the ball surface in Q1, early Q2 of next year that would line up with the February, March, and other paper we're seeing, uh, which is all lining up seemingly to the upside. And Monday, 999,000, so just a tick under 1 million contracts on Monday as well. Uh, the big dog on Monday, 80,000 of the October 17 puts, followed by number two, 75,000 of the October 20 calls. Number three, 64,000 of the October 25s. Number four, 56,000 of the OC 18s. And rounding out the top five, back to February, 40,000 of the February 42 half. So, Mr. Meatball, a lot to unpack out there during the week. Like we said, a, a strong, a robust, and explosive start to the week from a VIX options perspective. Then kind of petering out for the latter portion of the week. I know you were in a lot of presentations this week, but when you were watching the vol markets out there, what, if any, paper in Bixland caught your eye this week, sir? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, of course, they do this conference and, and vol blows up, so I don't didn't have a ton of time to look at at, uh, at paper. But, um, you know, it's interesting today that they're, the most active options are puts, isn't it? Um, the no 15s, the no 16s, the 17s, and uh, you got some D's 15s in there. Uh, the biggest call by is the Feb 21s and the Jan 20s. Um, and then you got some D's 50 and Jan 60 nonsense in there as well. But uh, it, it is interesting that, uh, that you know, on a, on a day where markets are, you know, arguably in the most peril they've been in a, a very long time, uh, we're, we're seeing mostly puts. Yesterday, kind of the same story. You did have a little bit of Nov action, but they were buying the Nov 15 puts yesterday and the Nov 18s. Uh, looks like actually they did a one by two yesterday. That was the biggest trade. Um, Wednesday, Wednesday, you had some March, uh, March 50 calls and some no 50, uh, a no, no 50s, no 25s. So like Wednesday was the big long vol day, it appears. That does appear to be the case. Yeah, fascinating paper if we start breaking into it a little bit. Uh, Rich, I know you're watching a lot of different factors and models out there in the markets throughout the week. Uh, do you pay much attention to VIX options? If so, what caught your eye, if anything, out there this week, sir? Well, I would say these kind of teeny, I would call them year-end teeny calls, don't surprise me at all. Because I think if I'm a, if I'm a whether it's a hedge fund or a long only manager, and I'm lagging, I'm looking for that Q4 rally. I'm not worried about the markets being down a little or whatever. I'm I'm worried. I, I'm I'm kind of try to load loading up to try to make make my year here in the last quarter of the year, right? And so the only thing I'm really worried about is uh, kind of a a big disaster in the markets, right? And that can come from the geopolitics we've can, we've seen. It could come from the debt ceiling. It could come from a number of num, number of places. But I'm not worried about the VIX going up a little bit. I'm only worried about the VIX going up a ton. And so I'd rather spend um, more dollars of premium, like our same dollars and get more options by buying some of those teeny calls either in December or maybe January. I was a little bit surprised about the February, but December and January doesn't surprise me because that that to me is just a, a nice portfolio hedge that, that would make me comfortable to lean long risk 
for a Q4 rally. And I would think that uh, given a lot of people are probably lagging their benchmarks this year, that they might be predisposed to want to have a bit of a Q4 rally. And so th- that doesn't surprise me to see those. And, and so that, um, you know, that I could see that kind of flow coming through, um, like I said, from from long only or hedge fund equity or credit managers. You know, the 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 people looking to kind of fade the move and, and buy some puts to kind of for for the normalization of the VIX curve. Um, that's that's what you'd kind of expect to see. Um, you know, where we're, we're kind of groove, groomed to think of that everything right now is just being still that kind of um, fade the move type of thing because uh, you know that's that's essentially how the market's been this year. So I think that just that's just a little bit of a Pavlovian instinct to want to fade anything. Um, I guess personally for me, given that I think liquidity is still kind of leaving the market, we see that with financial conditions. I don't know if we're in in a place where we can fade it as easily as we we maybe could have um, back in March when 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 uh, there was a little bit of macro risk that people wanted to fade. All right, listeners, let's keep on rolling right on here into the Vol ETP universe. We're already up against it. It's been a fun show talking about RMC and everything else, listeners. Uh, we could touch on SVIX really quickly. 24 right now, up actually on the week, up about almost one and a half points. Uh, doing some numbers today, 5,700 on the tape. The ADB is 5,400. That's moving in the right direction, up about 400. So SVIX continues to climb from a volume perspective and seems like it's going to beat that today. The number one size position in SVIX right now, 10,300 of the OC 20 puts. Those are obviously going the way of the Dodo today. So we'll see uh, after that, we have the about 6,000 of the Nov 28. So we'll see what takes the top spot in the weeks to come out there. But everybody wants to talk about its sibling product out there, which is, of course, Uvix. Uh, we named the show after it last week, listeners. We said a wild beast had been unleashed on the vol markets. <laughs> that certainly is the case. This post reverse split Uvix monstrosity, this Frankenstein's monster that we all wanted, myself included. I, I said on this show not too long ago, man, how great would it be to have a Uvix at a 40 handle out there? And once again, it's a great example of <laughs> careful what you wish for at the end of the day, listeners. If I'm a buyer of this, I better beware because yeah, this thing is just unleashed. It is unchained. It, it is a, a creature that needs to be beheld to be believed out there. It is truly impressive to watch. At about a 41 right now, I hit a high of 44 and a half just this morning, listeners. So it's already come in over three points uh, just on the level it was at this morning. This thing over the last five days has had a low of it hit 31 and a half on Tuesday, listeners. It hit 44 and a half just this morning. <laughs> My goodness, you're talking a 13-point range just in a couple of days. This thing is off the hook. That said, it does seem like things are improving out there for an options perspective. I know I was talking last week on the show, orders were getting kicked. We're hearing reports from a lot of you that even even single-leg orders were getting kicked. I was trying to work some multi-leg things out there. No chance in heaven. Uh, this week, even though the thing is whipping all over the place, I, I was able actually to manage to get a, a fly-off earlier this morning, which surprised me at a level... With strikes that weren't that active, quite frankly. In the past, I've had trouble getting some stuff off along those lines, but got some stuff off right before the show, and I was kind of surprised. At a decent level, didn't really have to pay up, so maybe the worm is turning out there. We shall see. Right now, volume-wise, 6,500 contracts, so it's not lighting the world on fire. Uh, the ADV is 15,000. That is unchanged on the week, which is interesting. So given all the, all the headlines, all the sturm and drong about all things Ubix, the ADV has not exploded yet, but maybe we'll get there today. We'll see. Seems like a little bit of a ways to go. We're only at 6,500 right now. The top size position, such as it is right now in Uvix, 3,400 of the OC4 calls. Uh, we'll come up against this. I'll break down what I put on for my fly on options oddities coming up a little bit later, listeners. But Mr. Meatball, obviously this one's been on your radar. This thing is just a, a wild beast right now. Uh, give us your thoughts on the, the newly revamped and newly unleashed Uvixer. Uh, it's going to be fun to trade. I will tell you that this is, uh, you know, if your your goal is to kind of a set and forget it with the, in this market, this is not you for you. This is the you opposite. Got, when you got a <laughs> fix at twenty, you're not going to be setting and forgetting. Uh, but the trading back and forth here, uh, long and short, is going to be really interesting. Uh, keep it. It's trading forty one thirty eight. Keep an eye on the forty two calls that expire today. They're currently sixty cents. And keep an eye on the 40 put that expired today. Those are a quarter. Uh, Both of those are one of those 
is highly likely to end up in the money. Uh, I just don't know which one. Everyone wants zero a day in the vol space. There you go. Uvix bringing it for you in spades. So if you want to, if you want to pop some tums between now and the end of the day, listeners, <laughs> dive on in. Mr. Rich, I'm not sure if you've been following this saga that is Uvix, of course, the levered VIX ETP out there. We were making fun of it forever because it was languishing. It had eroded back down to sub $2. Nobody cared about it. They said they were going to reverse split it. Even then, we always said they only did 10 to 1. It's only going to put it up to the mid-20s, maybe 30, maybe. Everyone wanted a 40 handle. They wanted a 15 or a 20x reverse split. And now the market has delivered what the reverse split didn't. And we are back up in a 40-plus handle. So things are rocking and rolling out there. Have you been watching this one? And if so, what are your thoughts, Mr. Rich? You know, I I will have to admit that the UVIX has been off my radar. Once it kind of went into those, like you said, below five, I'm like, I, I kind of took it off my screen. I got a so. feeling it's coming back on your radar now, sir. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> this this one, I was I did not realize that all this was going on. This is definitely back on my radar, but it hadn't been. And, not, and no, shame on me for not uh, not being aware of that. But this this one, this will be fun. And, and I think I, I agree with Mark that, you know, the way these are kind of constructed, et cetera, those, those, uh, those options expiring today, one of those is going to, can, you know, going to make people some some decent money today. Um, I, I don't know which way I would I would guess at this point. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't either. I don't hate the strangle, frankly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a fair point for sure. <laughs> they could both be in and both be out just as quickly out there yeah. as well with this thing. This thing is just a, a monster. Uh, we're coming up against, I want to get to the crystal ball, but really quickly, Rich, you touched on earnings vol a few times. We obviously crunch a lot of the earnings vol numbers on our site. Uh, we have, we're all hot and heavy right now in it, listeners. You can find it all for yourselves theoptionsinsider.com. Click on the Options News and Articles tab. You can get a deep dive into all the names that are popping off this week, a ton, including a bunch you folks love to trade out there this week. So a very a very interesting one, including Tesla, Netflix, a bunch of big names. Uh, really quickly, you kind of touched on it a few times now, Rich. Any other thoughts you have on uh, overall earnings vol before we head into the crystal ball? Well, I mean, generally, my bias is to want to uh, to fade earnings vol because uh, it usually gets a little overpriced. Not it's not, but you have to kind of do that across you know scores of names to, in order to kind of take advantage of that because they're, you're going to get a couple of those wrongs. But I think for generally, they're a little, a little be tend to be overpriced. Um, the vol the vol that is. But I think um, what we're seeing we're, we're definitely seeing some uh, a, a few more moves that I think are catching people off guard right now. And I think to me, the ones that, I, that are really on my radar are the financials because the, this, the the commentary we're hearing from the financials, you know, ultimately the economy is always about the, the, uh, the cost of money and the availability of money. And what I'm hearing from, from the financials does not suggest to me that that's uh, something that, that seems like a healthy environment um, in the near term. Uh, really quick before we roll out of the vol ETP universe, get to the crystal ball. I want to pay off our poll question from last week. Uh, we asked you a very simple question. It was inspired by our pro Q and a, uh, with Mr. Vixologist, we were talking about a lot of vol ETPs. So he put it out to you folks. He said, what is your preferred volatility ETP right now? Gave you four choices, SVIX, UVXY, VXX, and the aforementioned UVIX. I have a feeling we re-racked this right now and did it this week. UVIX might take it, but surprisingly, UVXY took it. 38.4%. I, I don't understand that result. Listen, I need someone who voted for it to write in to tell me why you would prefer the levered but neutered flavor versus... The fully lever, or maybe Uvix is just too wild for you. I can maybe see an argument for that. You want a little bit of the taste of Uvix without all the madness. Well, then maybe I could see your argument for UVXY. But still, if you're going to go inverse, or excuse me, if you're going to go levered, go big or go home. And, and nothing's bigger than Uvix right now. But uh, 38.4% of you choosing UVXY. Number two, 27.2% choosing SVIX. So interesting. Number three, 21.6% choosing VXX. And bringing up the rear, only 12.8% of you choosing uvix which again surprising results that's why we put it out to you folks at the end of the day speaking of surprises let's see what the market has in store for us it is time for the crystal ball it's time to peer into the future and reveal what the volatility gods hold in store it's time to look into the crystal ball all right, everybody, welcome to the Crystal Ball, the portion of the show where we attempt to wrestle with the Vol gods, see what they have in store for the coming week. And, you know, I was feeling more Vol last week. Listen, I was the lone person really feeling it this time last week. And yet, 
I clearly was not feeling enough. <laughs> I thought I was a little rich with my 19 and a quarter. As you'll recall, listeners, I was a little bit hesitant uh, to go that high, but I was kind of feeling it. And as it turns out, not far enough, 20, a little bit shy of 20 and three quarters as we're coming into the end of the show here, listeners. So I was about a point and a half away and I was the closest. Mr. Once in future Dr. Vicks, Mr. Rhodes was at an 18 and a half. He's usually above me. So that's interesting. And the meatball doing his palindromic nonsense was at a 1771. You know, the irony was that throughout the week, most of us were actually right. <laughs> you pick any point during the week, and I think we touched a lot of those levels. But uh, intriguing stuff. Looking here at the listeners, I see a, handles all over the place. 18s, 24s. Man, you guys are all over the place this week. Our producers will go through and see if anybody had a 20 and three quarters roughly level or anywhere around that. And We'll see what we can do on the fabulous prize front. Seems like you folks were as confused as we were this week. This was a tough one. So all that a long way around to saying, Rich, uh, nobody won no bullseyes on the show last week. So you get the dubious honor of going first. Uh, what do you feel for this time next week from a VIX cash perspective, sir? Um, you mentioned go big or go home, Mark. I'm thinking I'm going to guess 2771. Whoa. All right. I'm, I'm, going, I'm going big. I'm going big. Can, I, you, I, can I, you do I me a favor and change it. this whole podcast? I'm and I'm saying that this is <laughs> Mark. You mentioned uh, maybe a, maybe we're setting up for an ugly Monday. Um, I think if we set up for an ugly Monday, we might have an ugly week, and 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 maybe uh, that's that's maybe I'm you know maybe I'm not high enough. You want him twenty? You, you want you, him twenty seven? Do me a favor <laughs> and just to really annoy Mark and change can, your, your guest to twenty seven seventy two. Absolutely, absolutely. He does. He's known for his palindromic Vix guesses, Mister Rich. Let's he's try, do it. Let's he's trying to lure you to the dark side. All right. Since we're talking your palindromic nonsense, you get the fun of going next, Mister Meatball. What are you feeling? All right. Well. Uh, you know the old saying it. You know I like to fade my book with these guesses, so. I'm going to go uh, 1881. Wow, 1881. An interesting year. Made in my book. Is it a good vol prediction? I guess we'll find out, listeners. And I was typing as uh, everybody else was talking. I, I refuse to look at the chat so no one can, can lure me to the dark side with your guesses. I'm going to say a little bit more vol than I had last week, a little bit more vol than we have right now. I'm going to say a 21 Double, 21.55. So, man, we got quite the market this week. 18.81 on the dark side for Mark. Uh, 27.72 to the upside for Mr. Rich. Man, what will be happening in the markets uh, and what would be going on in the world if that is the case? And then myself at a still fraud. I thought I was going to be the high one. A uh, 21.55. All right. That was a fascinating journey through the world of Vol. Man, an hour flies when you're having fun, but unfortunately that music means we have come to the end of Volatility Views. For all of our on-demand listeners, that will conclude your broadcast week with us, I should say. Thank you for joining us out here. If you want more in your lives, of course, head on over to theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. I'll be back in a little bit for all sorts of options, oddities, fun. Ubix, put flies, calls going the way of the dodo in uh, upside telecoms, all sorts of fun going on over there in options oddities. Uh, but before we go, let's go back around the horn. Mr. Rich, how was your first time on Volvo? Did you have fun, sir? I had a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, and, and you guys uh, opened my eyes to kind of revisiting the UVIC, so I really appreciate <laughs> you that. You may come to regret that. We shall see. It, it is I'm a- sure I will come to regret <laughs> that, but for now, I'm, I'm happy. It is a wild, untamed beast. In the meantime, if folks want to keep up with everything you've got going on, where should they go? What should they do, sir? Well, on uh, the, the channel formerly known as Twitter, you can find me at Excel Richard. Um, you can always track me down with the reports I write for CME Group on Excel with Options. And um, if you go to the CME website, I'm, I'm doing options workshops for them. We did the first one this past Wednesday, and there's a series of over five Wednesdays I'm doing options workshops. And so people can kind of log in and kind of check that out if they want. Or you mentioned uh, you know the chart of the day. I do it not only on Twitter, but I also do it on LinkedIn. And so you can you can find me there as well. There you go. Give him a follow on the various platforms. Listeners, you get some of his insights outside of his appearances on these shows. Maybe we'll look forward to your upcoming UVIX chart, Rich, where you regale all of your trade. I think a nice, crazy long-term time fly like you like maybe in UVIX might be a fun chart. I look forward to seeing that uh, on your chart of the day sometimes. <laughs> all right. And Mr. Meatball, same question for you, sir. Where should folks go if they want more option pit goodness in their lives? Yeah, you know, come uh, go to optionpit.com. I'm writing the Trader's Edge every day. 
uh, gave my 10 thoughts on, or my five takeaways from RMC. And uh, we're going to put out a video. I'm uh, actually in about 12 minutes. Gem and I are going to talk about our, our, take, our big takeaways from the conference. There you go. Check them out. Optionpit.com is the place to go. We got to get on out of here. Thanks to all of you for joining us out here. I'm looking here in the chat. We got levels all over the place again. Frank's at a 22. Option God, 1978. Queen, she's usually pretty prescient. She's at my level. You're copying me, Queen. She's at 2120, so she's close to me. We got Nichols hanging out. He's been at 24 for multiple weeks now. He's going back to 24 again. All sorts of prognostications. If you're listening after the fact, listeners, and you're listening to it today, remember, you can't guess Vol for next week, sometime next week, if you listen. You got a guest today. So the day the show hits the network, if you want to send your questions in, or I should say send your guesses in uh, to questions at theoptionsinsider.com. You can do it on Twitter as well. Uh, we collate all of them. And if you come within a tenth of a point, you have to have the same margin of victory that we do here on the show. Tenth of a point, you too can win fabulous prizes. That is going to do it for us on the on demand side. Uh, head out there, have a great, safe weekend, listeners. We'll see you back here next Friday, another episode of Volatility Views. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>